I just want to have another shot at this uh, kind of challenge, I suppose, that Variablast threw down for alternative explanations for detailed human behaviour. I'm not going to narrow it down to human sexual behaviour, where it started off from, but uh, just, just the idea that, with, that something like evolutionary psychology, for example, can um, account for quite detailed human behaviour, which uh, I would want to challenge. Uh, the, I think I mentioned in the last video I made on this subject, talking about Freud and polymorphous perversity, uh, but a lot of people don't like Freud or don't find the psych psychoanalysis particularly compelling. So I thought I'd have a shot this time at uh, a kind of evolutionary biological account instead. And I think I'm probably borrowing from Robert Ornstein here. He did a book called something like The Evolution of Consciousness uh, some years ago, which is great, actually, really good. But um, in, this, in there, there's a section about bipedalism, the fact that we walk on two legs uh, and, and, uh, and what kind of an effect that might have. And it's, it's, it's somewhat um, speculative, of course. You can't really test for a thing like that. But it's a pretty convincing account, I think. And what he says is that, that, that bipedalism, our, our um, homo ancestors walking on two legs, probably started about three and three quarter million years ago with Lucy, the Australopithecine that was found a few years ago, um, who was the, which was the first of the species apparently to do that, and and they walked around on two legs for for ages. You know, didn't we didn't use tools for another million years or so after that, but we did um, at least have this ability to walk around. And several things flow from that. Just that I just that act of standing up and freeing your front freeing your front paws really. I mean, the first things that happens is that. Um, is that the front paws become available as 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 kind of prehensile um, limbs, really? You know, instead of having to put weight on them and have and have quite hard and uh, intractable paws, you start to be able to do quite fine things. They're not load bearing anymore. They're not weight bearing, uh, and they're and they're not and they're not used for propulsion. They're not used for walking around on. So they're freed up to do all kinds of things which in turn leads to the possibility of, um, of kind of increasing the range of things you can do, increasing the, your survival ability in different environments. Um, related to that, uh, bipedalism also is really, really efficient. Really. It's really efficient. You know, humans can climb trees, they can swim, they can carry stuff, they can walk for miles, they can run. Um, you know, there's a wide range of stuff, which again opens up a lot of different environments. Um, so we have no natural ecological niche, I think Robert uh, Ornstein says in that book. We can, we can take ourselves into all kinds of environments um, very quickly, really, really quickly, and, uh, and survive in them. So we have no, and we just need, the evidence of that is all around us, you know, the human beings right across the world, from the coldest places to the hottest places, the highest places, to, and so on. Uh, so that's the other thing that bipedalism does. Right. The second part of this bipedalism thing is what else happens? Uh, and what else happens is when you put all your weight on your back limbs, which is what we've done, uh, there's an awful lot of um, development has to take place in those limbs to support you, particularly around the pelvis. So we've got a huge heavy pelvis compared to other primates, far, far bigger than a, uh, than a, 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 a chimp or a bonobo or a gorilla or anything like that. Massive thing. Uh, and because it's so big, and, and because it has to bear such weight, the pelvic opening is actually quite small. The hole in the middle of your pelvis is quite small, which means that ch childbirth is particularly constrained. Uh, you know, you can't push anything through that hole that's too big, basically, which means that human babies are much smaller by, or and much, a much smaller head, particularly. Uh, by proportion than any other primate and most other animals actually and that in turn leads to two factors two factors fall out of that the first factor is that um, that when a baby is born a human baby is born it's not really finished the human brain is not complete when the baby is is born there's all kinds of pruning that goes on over the first years of life all, a lot of the dendrites lots of the neuronal connections are, are kind of pruned back it's like a, it's ill, it's not well, very well, you know, it's, it's not just not kind of finished really. That's the first thing. Um, 
And the second thing is that it's incredibly dependent. You know, again, compared to other primates and, and other mammals, we are an incredibly uh, dependent uh, species for the first couple of years of life. Well, more than a couple, probably four or five at least years of life, we're very, very dependent. Uh, now, what that means is that we have to, the only way we can survive as children is, to, is within complex social groups. You, know, you, you really need uh, a, a pair, at least a pair bonded set of uh, parents to survive as a human child in, in, in our hunter gatherer origins I'm talking about here and you probably need a tribe to support you you know the, the old say it takes a village to raise a child there's some truth in that in terms of the origins simply because of the nature of our birth that we are born unfinished and bloody helpless okay so those are the factors and you put those all together what you've got is a child being born into a, into a, into a, with a highly adaptable body, you know, these things with hands and, and feet, within a highly constructed social environment, and with a brain that's not quite finished. I mean, that's, to me, that's a scenario right there for a lot of nurture, a lot of effects post birth, a lot of um, non genetic determination. Uh, a lot of moulding and shaping and crafting that must go on after the baby is born. And I think it's much more likely that it's those kinds of effects that account for the details of, um, of, of human behaviour. Not the general drives, of course, you know, it's, it doesn't account for... You know, we don't, we don't need to look for those kind of things for the production of cortisol, the production of, of testosterone, the production of adrenaline, or any of those kinds of stuff. All of the basic biochemical drives will be there. But how those drives are manifest, what kinds of behaviours issue from those and satisfy those needs, is uh, going to be part of the pruning and shaping process of the unformed infant brain taking place within a highly adaptable body embedded in a social environment.